Good morning, folks. Jim Jaquetta here. We, uh, we thank you folks for taking uh, some time out of your, your busy schedules to uh, hear about the StageBox IP camera back system. What's uh, uh, revolutionary about this concept is we take a, a uh, camera back system and integrate and combine all of our signals, bi-directional video, uh, time code, uh, intercom, gen lock, uh, camera control, all over a network connection. And uh, the way we do that is we use uh, synchronous Ethernet, IEEE 1588. But I'll get into the, the details and, and the engineering behind the, uh, the stage box. Uh, as most of you, I'm sure most of you know, you know, the, the traditional way of, of shooting a, a broadcast event, uh, this, is, this, this is a picture of a, um, uh, an event, uh, looks like a golf outing, uh, NEP, you can see there's a, a dozen or so NEP trucks. So Stagebox, we feel, may revolutionize the industry, it may reduce the footprint of the trucks that are required at a sporting event, at a golfing event, at a news event, I don't think it's going to eliminate it. So uh, uh, George Hoover at NAP uh, gave a great uh, presentation at NAB this past, uh, uh, earlier this year, and uh, he talked about how uh, they have multiple trailers doing graphical overlays, instant replay. So the whole uh, very high-tech, very high-end show is produced on-site. Uh, the final product leaves the venue, and uh, uh, commercials are inserted back at, at master control, and it goes out on the air. Uh, where we feel Stagebox uh, will shine is uh, applications, second and third tier sporting events, uh, high school sports, collegiate sports, uh, 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 news events that maybe are not quite as high profile that demand sending uh, uh, a satellite truck or a big uh, ENG truck. So we feel this will, this will broaden our access to live video uh, uh, and maybe reduce the footprints of, of these trucks in, in a typical scenario like we see here. Uh, you know, these trucks are very expensive. They can cost millions of dollars. There's fiber optic connectivity, HDSDI routing switchers, production switchers. Uh, and these trucks can only be in one place at one time. Uh, uh, if we centralize master control uh, uh, in a central location, multiple shows in different locations can be produced throughout the day. So in the morning, the central master control could be doing a show out of New York. Uh, then a few hours later in, in another time zone, they could do a show from Chicago. Later in the day, they could produce a show from from LA, so the, the master control is not stuck at one venue, stuck in the truck. So we can centralize that. And the, the stage box technology was created by the BBC R&D department for their own needs. Uh, their engineering team saw that uh, uh, you know, they needed to reduce costs, like we all do. They needed to reduce the, the footprint required to produce a mobile production. So they've deployed uh, 100 plus of these uh, stage box uh, devices. And uh, all the remote production work is done with, with, with stage box now. Uh, uh, you do need a, uh, a significant data uh, connection. Um, each camera does AVCI 100 or 100 megabits per second. You can lower the bit rate. Uh, we're working on uh, uh, doing uh, lower bit rates for like H.264. Uh, uh, so we're, we're working on, on, obviously, the beauty of this with camera control and synchronous Ethernet is that uh, the very low latency. So the video engineer can be doing paint control uh, back in master control hundreds or thousands of miles away because we're communicating at a higher bit rate, ABCI 100, uh, uh, that's, that, that gives us that capability. If we start compressing the video uh, uh, down, we're going to add latency. So there's pluses and minuses uh, uh, to the technology. 
So, so here's just a, a simple uh, block diagram. So uh, the, the systems can be set up in, in a unicast environment. So if you have just one camera, one receiver, we can do point-to-point -point, uh, uh, unicast. Uh, or we can um, uh, multicast enable where we have multiple cameras going to multiple destinations. Uh, you can have multiple unicast sessions, so you can have more than one camera, uh, but the, the power of multicast is uh, that's a requirement for the synchronous Ethernet or the IEEE 1588, and then it's common that a given camera might want to go to the press box as well as the production truck uh, or confidence monitors throughout the, the venue or the event. So, so uh, having your video streams multicast enabled can be a uh, a big plus for, for the workflow. Uh, so uh, another uh, reason, the, 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 uh, the main reason why the BBC chose AVC I100 is that it's compatible with uh, most nonlinear editing systems, you know, whether you're using Avid, Final Cut Pro, uh, or any of the Adobe products. Uh, they all uh, support or have uh, an ingest, uh, they can ingest directly uh, ABC I100. If you uh, bring in other more compressed formats, uh, like an H.264, uh, you have to do some transcoding, you have to ingest, you have to decode before you can edit. You know, H.264, you, you can't, it's not easy to, to, to natively edit. You, you usually have to ingest it, transcode it convert it to uh, a more editable format. So the BBC has been able to uh, stream video to the web. Uh, uh, they, they're able to edit uh, near live or 10 minutes behind the live production is, is their typical workflow. So they do these uh, long uh, uh, concert events, week-long concert events. Uh, I have a video at the end of the presentation. I'll give you a link to it. But it shows how uh, over the course of a long weekend, uh, normally what they have to do is uh, after each performer goes on stage or after each news piece or each, uh, it's not until the live event is over uh, that they typically start editing and repackaging the content for distribution to the web or second screen. So this way the, the second screen or web uh, 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 delivery of the live programming can be, you know, five to ten minutes behind the real live event, and the viewer at home doesn't even know there's a, a five or ten minute delay. So, so they're repackaging the content virtually as it happens. They suck it into their nonlinear editing, and and they're they're, they're ready to roll, uh, uh, re repackaging the, the content as it happens. So I don't want to be redundant. So so the BBC uh, developed this. Uh, Vidovation has been chartered to bring this technology to the U.S., to North America. Uh, uh, so we've uh, uh, introduced this uh, uh, recently uh, to the North American market. Uh, we have some uh, new additions that I'll get into later in the Stagebox family that will be coming out at NAB uh, this year. So here's a, here's a close-up of, of the device. Uh, it's probably easier to see it in the PowerPoint. So. Uh, this is the, the, the I.O. side of it. So you can see you have an SDI in and an SDI out. You have an SFP port. So in this particular case, it's, a, it's an electrical uh, SFP. But, you know, we could swap this out for uh, an optical Ethernet SFP. So it's an Ethernet connection. So it's either a wired uh, or an optical Ethernet. Uh, SDI in and out. So it's a transceiver time code in and out, and reference in and out. This would be GenLock. So typically what we do is uh, one of the units is declared the master. So if you did have a small production truck or you did have a house reference signal, you could feed that in here to, into ref in. And it's got a loop out, so you can loop in, loop out. Uh, we can provide you with the mini BNC to full-size BNC adapters here if needed. Uh, uh, if there is no GenLock reference, uh, you can designate one of the cameras as the master input, or you can feed just SDI in uh, confidence video going up to the camera uh, and lock off of that. So that could be used as the, the master reference uh, uh, for the system. Uh, then on the bottom, uh, you see here we have uh, 
a 5-pin XLR for, for a stereo analog audio in and stereo uh, or two-channel audio out. This is great for uh, IFB or intercom. Um, the, the SDI streams going up and down each uh, handle a payload of up to 16 uh, channels of uh, embedded audio. Uh, typically, the camera uh, is providing those streams, the embedded streams. Uh, if you had a more elaborate setup, say in a press box, you could uh, had a lot of ancillary audio that maybe wasn't coming from the camera. Uh, you could use audio embedders to, to add those extra audios. But what's nice is that any stage box on the network can pick up any of the digital audio streams that are embedded, so we can port those out for, for local monitoring. Uh, so if it's good for diagnostic purposes or if uh, uh, cameraman number two is waiting for a cue from camera station number one, uh, he can listen to the program. He can dial into the program of that camera and listen for his cue. Say, okay, now we go to Bob live, you know, down on the floor of the Staples Center. He can be tapped in. The cameraman uh, can be tapped in and, and give a cue to the talent to start talking. Uh, so the, all, all kinds of cool stuff can be done. Also, uh, uh, well, I don't want to jump ahead. There, there, there's a, t a tally function, but that's on the next slide. Uh, here's a four-pin power uh, XLR, so you can uh, power the unit. Uh, they, they come with uh, an external uh, AC power supply, or you can feed an external battery either here. Uh, here's camera control. Uh, I got a little Limo uh, uh, connector here, and here, here, here's the on-off switch. Uh, camera control is great. Uh, we haven't met a camera that we're not able to support. Uh, you just need to uh, let us know what camera, and we can have uh, a cable made, or we can tell you where to buy a cable uh, to, to mate the uh, uh, control port to your uh, camera rig. Uh, this is the top of the unit. So there's a reset button. You know, if uh, 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 you put a firmware upgrade into it or whatnot, you might want to re reboot it. Uh, that's a reset button. Uh, this is a multicolored. Uh, tally. Uh, it's got um, blue, red, and green. So uh, we have some, you know, uh, uh, red is more of the standard uh, tally color. Uh, blue and green can, can mean other things, standby, whatnot. You can decide what that means. But this way, it's a very bright indicator on the top of the unit. If the camera does not have a, a tally light or it's not uh, prevalent, this, this could be used as a backup or, or as your primary tally light. That This will glow uh, red, green, or blue, as I discussed. Uh, the unit can be uh, set up as a Wi-Fi access point uh, to control for control. So uh, a wireless device, a notebook computer, a tablet, or whatnot could talk to the stage box. You don't have to be wired to the network in order to control a given stage box. So if you're in close proximity to it, uh, it has an ask, access point. You can uh, the SSID is usually, you know, stage box dash the last four digits of the box's uh, serial number. So you can uh, log into that. Um, let me uh, keep going here. Oh. So this is a card. Uh, it's, uh, it's the stage box typhoon card, as we're calling it. The, the name may change uh, once we formally release it at uh, NAB. But uh, what you can see, uh, what's available today are, are, the, are the, uh, the standalone boxes. So what the VBC does is uh, they'll put these on a shelf to receive a signal. Uh, we're working on repackaging these uh, in a rack mount configuration for more traditional base station receiver. And then uh, uh, conversely, the, um, in addition, the, uh, the Typhoon card, uh, can go in a nonlinear editor or uh, an inexpensive PC uh, as a capture device. Uh, so, so what it does, it can take uh, uh, multiple streams in. There's four BNC IOs. Uh, what's nice about it is it doesn't require much resources from the host PC. So if the host PC is uh, 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 primary function is nonlinear editing. We have silicon on this board here to do the decoding and in future revisions, even encoding. So this, this primarily right now is set up as a decoder. Uh, uh, our engineers by NAB time will have firmware that will allow encoding as well as decoding. 
so so the horsepower is here on the board. It's on the silicon. So we're not stealing uh, uh, power or resources from the computer. So an inexpensive PC could be set up as a capture device, or uh, we could get a 1RU PC, put this card in there. Um, the PC really is just there for power and administrative uh, control. Uh, and again, this, like I said, this would fit in a, in a, in a, in a PC, uh, Avid, Final Cut Pro, or Adobe uh, nonlinear editing uh, edit uh, uh, device. So again, no transcoding, uh, um, no decoding, unless you need to. Uh, uh, this device will allow you to, to take the native stream, record it to, to the hard drive, uh, immediately uh, edit on the fly, uh, decode it, and stream it out as, as a baseband uh, HDSDI you know, to put up on your video wall or on your monitors. Uh, it, uh, it unpacks the UDP and RTP streams. Uh, as I said, it'll decode. Uh, we have we have hooks to uh, connect to multi viewers. Uh, the industry is starting to write uh, 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 firm uh, uh, computer drivers to talk to the Stagebox Typhoon. Uh, we have a couple of partners. This, this is one partner in particular. Uh, this will be shown uh, again. This is I, this was at a demo at uh, uh, BBC most recently, and we will be demoing this at at NAB this coming year. So you can see how you can have the four cameras uh, coming into the, the decode card, uh, uh, showing it on the local nonlinear editing PC. But if you wanted to put it up on your video wall, you could route out the uh, the baseband video um, out of one of these ports to, to your to your multi viewer in your control room. So you know it wraps and encodes the video in uh, M, uh, MXF uh, wrappers and containers. Uh, it'll write an MXF uh, file, so it supports all the hooks that are required for nonlinear nonlinear editing. Uh, just just uh, gives you a seamless IP uh, workflow. Uh, the heart of uh, the Typhoon card is two big Xilinx FPGAs. So the beauty beauty of that is using field programmable gate arrays is that we can uh, upgrade firmware. Um, the current target boards. Uh, um, uh, will not support H.265. Uh, uh, probably in the coming year, we'll, we'll re-spin the boards, put more horsepower in these FPGAs to do H.265. Uh, but right now, it's doing AVC I100. Uh, uh, H.264 is, is uh, uh, we have some uh, beta modes for that, that format, uh, but th that should be available by NAB. And, and here's a little summary, you know, so, so uh, compressed AVI, uh, audiovisual uh, uh, input, you know, so the, the stream coming in, the IP stream uh, can go through the PCI Express host bus to record to the hard, hard drive. Um, you can uh, stream out or, or, or port the IP stream out to the uncompressed or the baseband uh, SDI outputs. Uh, eventually, we'll be able to take HDSDI in and encode and stream out, stream to the web. So, so the Typhoon card eventually will be also an encoding uh, or streaming or source uh, card. Uh, uh, those features are coming. Uh, uh, the system supports 16 uh, channels of 24-bit uh, audio, you know, embedded audio. So this is just a little block diagram of, of what's going on on the, on the Typhoon card. Uh, it, it supports uh, uh, Gen 1, 2, and 3 of, um, uh, actually supports Gen 1 and 2 of PCI Express. Uh, the Gen 3 is coming. Uh, that will probably be available at uh, uh, NAB in, uh, in, in this coming April. Uh, right now, the units will only go up to 1080p 30, uh, uh, 1080p 60, and 5994. Uh, or 3G HDSDI will be supported soon. So these are just some of the, the future-looking uh, uh, features that are coming that we expect to have ready uh, uh, come NAB this coming year. So I, I briefly mentioned this uh, synchronous Ethernet uh, uh, protocol. So here's a, um, uh, a box that uh, we sell here in the US a telecom provider in uh, in the UK called the ARG. They're a great company. 
They have a lot of interesting uh, IT-based products. So they've partnered with us and with the Stagebox team. Uh, BBC is working with them very closely. What's nice about their products is they, they make a very robust uh, uh, IEEE 1588 compliant precision timing protocol uh, uh, switch. Uh, it's a layer two switch. Uh, it has a GPS input, so if you want to uh, have a, a, an external precision timing uh, input, you can hook a GPS receiver to this. What's nice about that is not everyone's network is multicast enabled. So if you hit segments, so let's just say you send your video over level three Vivix circuit or a telecom circuit, that provider is probably not going to give you a multicast enabled connection between New York and LA. So what you can do is you'd use switches like this and set up synchronous Ethernet islands. So there'd be an island in LA synchronizing those cameras, an island in New York synchronizing those cameras together. And then maybe the studio is also in New York. Uh, so the two islands are synchronized. So how do we synchronize these two islands and, and, and when the video streams come from LA into New York? Well, we, we would use the, the atomic clock of GPS. So the two islands could be precision timed uh, from, from the GPS clock. Uh, this switch supports uh, 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 internet group management protocol, which is, is a necessity for managing uh, multicast streams on your network. So, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, why, why do we want multicast? One is, is to do the synchronous Ethernet, the 1588, but, and also secondly, so we can hit multiple destinations. So it economizes on bandwidth. I mean, we could send a given camera to 100 uh, destinations, unicast, we'd have to have 100 streams. So 100 streams times 100 megs, that's a lot of bandwidth. If we multicast enable, we send one stream out, and then everyone shares that it's multicast. So, uh, for you guys that know what multicast is, uh, I don't want to preach to you, but that's the that's the gist of, of uh, or the beauty of uh, multicast. But all your switches, all your routers, uh, uh, have to have the multicast function turned on. Uh, most modern uh, Cisco switches, ARG switches, uh, most of them have this capability. Uh, your IT de your IT departments are probably aware of that. The functions just need to be turned on, so it's really not a big deal. Uh, oh, one other mention too. Uh, there's a version of this switch that uh, I don't have a photo of it that uses the uh, Neutrix uh, EtherCon connections. You know the XLR uh, ruggedized Ethernet connection. So that's nice. The broadcasters really like that. You can't get that from Cisco. I mean, Cisco makes IEEE 1588 switches. They're very expensive. This is a, a, a enterprise telecom grade switch, uh, but a little bit more reasonable than than, than Cisco. So why, I, I kind of alluded to this, so why did the BBC choose ABCI 100? As I said, compatible with uh, 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 nonlinear editors. Uh, a lot of you uh, sports guys out there, sports leagues, you, you're probably using uh, JPEG 2000. There's nothing wrong with that, but, but usually your payloads, uh, uh, you know, it's usually a 270 megabit per second uh, transport stream, and you know, you might have 180, 200 megs of, of payload in there. Uh, uh, the BBC felt that that was overkill. That that uh, 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 we can we can get a, a fine quality video through using AVC I100 at 100 megabits per second uh, and still maintain compatibility with our nonlinear editors. But uh, for those of you not familiar with AVC I100, the I stands for intra frame. So just like JPEG 2000, it's only compressing within each frame. If there's redundancy from frame to frame, you know, baseball field, the green grass doesn't change in the background, a uh, higher, uh, uh, lower bit rate or, 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 or um, inter-frame protocols like H.264 uh, and 265 look for re re repetitiveness across frames. But you have to buffer those frames, so that adds delay, that adds latency. So, so uh, the benefits of ABC I100, like JPEG 2000, is very low latency. Uh, we're only compressing within a given frame. So there's about a frame of the delay to encode and decode. Uh, we're working on getting the uh, latency down to, uh, to one frame total or half a frame on each side. Uh, uh, but still, you know, uh, 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 a two frame uh, latency to encode, decode. Obviously, then plus network delay is pretty fast. 
Uh, we're using a 10-bit sampling, uh, 422 color space. And the, uh, the profile that we're using is the, uh, the, the, the 422 uh, intra profile, level 4.1. Uh, and we're using uh, C, AVL, uh, C, uh, entropy encoding. So, so as I mentioned, and it's a 100 megabit bit stream. You can throttle it down. Uh, the quality still looks pretty good if you throttle it down to 50 megs. Uh, 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 so so that you do have that capability. And there are today uh, uh, settings for H.264. So you're welcome to use those settings as well. Uh, as I mentioned with the audio, you know, 16 channels of audio per SDI stream. So you got SDI coming in and coming out. So there's 16 streams going up, 16 streams going down. So one thing I should mention, though, it is a bi-directional device. Uh, uh, but the bi-directional mode is only recommended if you have a very clean network. Uh, if you have a very tight quality of service, or it's your own private network, and you're controlling other traffic on the network, the system works great bi-directionally. If you're going over a shared network and the quality of service is not quite the same, you don't have quite the, the high service level agreement with your provider, we recommend going into simplex mode. And then simplex mode gives you uh, deeper uh, buffering for packet reordering. It does do reordering in bi-directional mode. So basically what, what, what happens is I showed you those two FPGAs uh, on the motherboard. Uh, there's limited horsepower on there. Uh, future models will have more horsepower when we, when we support uh, H.2, uh, uh, when we support 1080p60, we'll have more horsepower in future models. So, so if your network requires forward error correction, we now have released, a, a, a officially released a forward error correction uh, firmware. The latest firmware supports that. We have deeper buffering uh, in, in that mode. We can do uh, uh, deeper packet reordering. So if you have a network that's you know breaking up your packets and they're not arriving at the same time, they're taking different different paths. It's going through uh, a public network of some sort. Uh, uh, we have a much more robust transport stream in simplex mode. So so uh, just just remember that. So you know then then obviously we'd only have 16 channels coming down. We wouldn't have re 16 channels returning. Uh, but two channels of bidirectional audio, and as I stated, we, you can map any one of the embedded audios to the analog ins or outs. Uh, I mentioned before monitoring a given SDI uh, uh, port on the analog audio output. You can do the same thing. You can use it as an embedder. So just be careful, though. You don't want to write over program video with, with uh, uh, audio that you're inserting. But let's just say ad hoc, somebody walks onto the set. Oh, we need another mic. Uh, what are we going to do? That you could plug uh, a, a line level input, uh, obviously you need a microphone peer, preamp, but you can on the fly embed uh, an audio channel uh, into one of the SDI streams through the audio input. The, these uh, I'm alluding to these uh, uh, audio inputs and outputs down here. So it gives you that flexibility. Uh, the audio payload does add 20, 21 megabits per second to the uh, transport stream. So it does start to be 120, 121 megabit per second stream if you run the video wide open. As I stated, you know, the quality still looks good to down to about 50 megabits per second. So if 121 megabit starts to be too much, you can throttle that down. Uh, so the, the, the BBC wanted to use a open standard. So that, that's another reason why, you know, they like the, the AVC I100 uh, protocol. Uh, uh, they want to encourage uh, other vendors. Uh, we're working on uh, uh, SDK for drivers to be written for all the different nonlinear editors, uh, multi-viewers. We are getting some vendor support. Uh, oddly enough, uh, the initial support seems to be coming out of the UK. So it's uh, uh, customers or vendors for the BBC are the, are the initial ones developing uh, some of these drivers that are needed for multi-viewers and uh, uh, other types of nonlinear editors or other gear that might want to ingest the, these these signals. Uh, uh, so it's, it's uh, SFP wired or optical Ethernet, no jumbo frames, uh, internet protocols, uh, 791, unicast, multicast. Uh, 
So it's an RTP real-time protocol over UCP for the audio, video, and data control. Um, and then uh, RTP packet reordering and buffering. So that's the, the, the mechanism that we're using for the reordering and the buffering. And then obviously the, the forward error correction is SMPTE 2022. Uh, the units have some statistical monitoring too, so you can see on a graph in the unit, it'll tell you how many packets are having to be reordered. So you can see, hey, there's something going on with my network. Why are so many packets being reordered? Uh, you know, I, I uh, have a service level agreement. This is supposed to be a clean circuit. What's going on here? So you can kind of see if the unit is, is uh, uh, smoothing out some of the bumps in a choppy network so you can anticipate a, a potential problem before it actually becomes serious. You can keep an eye on things and, and see uh, if the unit is struggling because the network is uh, uh, dropping an undue number of uh, uh, packets uh, across the network. So how does the GenLock work? How does this uh, precision timing uh, protocol work? So, so, so in this scenario, uh, this stage box here on the left, we're going to call it the master. So this would probably be on the receive side, in your production truck, or your smaller production truck, uh, or in the control room. And in this case, we're not feeding in a separate uh, reference. We're just taking the SDI in. So maybe we're sending a program feed out to the cameraman so he can see uh, they have a monitor in front of the talent so they can see when to speak, or, or it's a, a for an interview. So he can see the program feed and say, OK, we go to you, Bob, out in the field. Boom. He hears and sees his cue. and, and that's typically what's coming up on the uh, on the upbound feed. Uh, the precision timing protocol uh, sends our our reference signal, and then that gives a GenLock output to the camera, locking it back to the signal here from the control room. So so uh, 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 this works really well. Uh, you can see here in the next slide. You know, so obviously the camera's got to have a GenLock input. Uh, if it's a device that doesn't have a gen lock in, you'd have to put an external frame sync. The uh, stage box does not have a, a built-in uh, frame sync if your device does not have a reference or a gen lock input. So in this scenario here, it's an older uh, tape. It's even, it's even uh, got a tape here. What's a tape? I don't even know what that is. Uh, uh, so you'd have to put the uh, uh, um, a frame sync external to the stage box. So so. So this sends a synchronous signal up, uh, but the problem is, is the video coming down is uh, is uh, is uh, asynchronous. Uh, if video two sends an asynchronous uh, feed down, it, it, you know, so what do we do in that case? So so uh, well, no. In this scenario, if we feed GenLock to the camera, the video coming down is then synchronized with the video coming up. Everything is good. Uh, uh, there might be some phase differential, but uh, most production switchers can handle up to a line uh, to get the phase alignment. Uh, you know, with cable runs, even when things are all gen locked together, uh, uh, cable length differential, even optical length differentials, uh, there's always a little bit of slop uh, uh, um, uh, up to a line that, that to phase things up. But everything will be in frequency uh, going through the system. Uh, so here's another scenario. So this is source synchronous. So so this is kind of like um, uh, uh, when we don't have IEEE 1588 available, or, or we're either doing point to point, or we don't have the infrastructure set up to do the 1588 precision timing protocol. So what happens here is uh, uh, this input it just synchronizes off of this input and, and the two the up and the down video just kind of operate independently. You know, this one just locks the output here is locked to the input over here, the output here is locked to the input over there. Uh, the caveat is you can't do multicast then. It's only point to point. Uh, uh, everything can be frequency locked in this scenario, but we won't get a, 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 an accurate phase lock. Uh, uh, so here's a, just an example of what the interface looks like. Uh, this just happens to be one of the, the screens. Uh, you don't need any special software. You don't need a special dashboard. Uh, uh, it's all it's all uh, a web-based uh, GUI. So any any device that has a, uh, a web browser can can talk to the stage box and and control it. Uh, it's very straightforward. All the functionality is there. 
Uh, here's a, uh, a block diagram of a, uh, a remote a robotic camera setup that we've done. So you can see here um, uh, we have a, uh, uh, a camera controller and a monitor. We have a stage box and we have a robotic camera here. So, so the, the controller unit is uh, uh, pan and tilting the camera and the, uh, the data protocol is going through this uh, uh, data port here on the, on the bottom of the unit. And there's all different settings. Like I said, you know, we support uh, 232, 422, 485. We haven't met a protocol that we can't support. Uh, our, our firmware developers, if something new comes out, they're very quick at that. They're very conscious of, of the need for uh, uh, control support. So here comes the juicy part, and I hope I do it justice. So what is this precision timing protocol all about? You know, how, how does it work? What's the mechanism? So, so there's, there's kind of two phases. So the first phase just sets up uh, the first requirement of, of, of a switch, per se. Uh, not all switches are created equal. This ARG switch is actually, its clock is more accurate than the measurement devices they use to measure clock accuracy at a lot of the test labs. So this is actually better than a lot of the reference equipment that's out there. So you need switches that have a very accurate timekeeping device in them. Otherwise, this won't work. And that's part of the IEEE 1588. So you can assume if you buy a 1588 uh, compliant switch, it's going to have an accurate clock as, as, as part of that. Um, it's easy to get the, the clocks in frequency. So, so a, a sync packet is sent out and a follow-up packet. So, so uh, 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 well, well so let, let me just start here. So source synchronous, I mentioned, is the non-PTP um, uh, or 1588 protocol. And it's just very straightforward. It's point to point. The master unit locks, the slave unit masters to the, the the master, it's just point to point, uh, master and slave, and it, it's pretty straightforward. So synchronizing packets are sent out, and the uh, receiving, uh, uh, the slave unit will lock to the master unit. In precision timing protocol, it's a little bit more complex. So we describe that down here. So in, in the first scenario, we just get a clock lock, but not a phase lock. So uh, you will need, you know, hopefully your production switcher in the, if you're using source synchronous, will have that line or at least a few pixels of uh, phase adjustment to line things up. Everything will be locked, but it might be a little out of phase. In precision timing for protocol, we get both. We get the frequency uh, lock and the phase lock. It's part of the standard. Uh, the slaves connect to a layer two multi-class network to synchronize their clocks. So, so what happens is, uh, the grand master clock. So, so one of the nodes or one of the devices on the network decides, I'm going to be the grand master clock. Uh, that can be done manually or automatically. And uh, that unit then sends uh, reference packets or timing packets to all the other slave devices on the network. It could be other stage boxes. It could be other IEEE 1588 compliant devices. It could be other switches, other nodes. Any kind of IT gear on the network may that will accept the 1588 timing signal will be sent these packets. So what happens is a sync packet is sent first, followed by a follow packet. And uh, so the sync packet will say, hey, the time of day is X. And it goes to the slave, and the slave reads, OK, that's the time of day. The follow actually tells, uh, uh, in its packet, tells the slave device when the first sync packet left. Because the sync packet you know, went through the, the, the MAC address stack, and maybe there's a little bit of buffering. And then by the time it leaves the, the physical port, there could be some delay. So the follow packet monitors that process. Oh, it sat, it sat in the stack for a few clock ticks, and then it was finally buffered out. So this is kind of like your, your error. So it says, oh, OK, you left it. 3 p.m. on Tuesday, but you really left at 3 p.m. in a few milliseconds because of some buffering. This 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 sends that little little error correction uh, packet. Um, but obviously, you got the the transit time, so you're going to be a little off due to the, the network latency. 
So initially, it just assumes zero latency because we're just trying to get a frequency lock. We're not trying to, you know, so you're going to be off. You know, say your network delay is, is 100 milliseconds, you're going to be off 100 milliseconds. So, so then a follow-up uh, uh, timestamp is sent. Uh, let me go to the next slide. So, so uh, the slave device makes a delay request. Uh, and then the master device gives you the delay response. So through the initial sync follow-up, the delay request, the delay response, the system gets an idea of the round trip delay through the, net, the network. Uh, more sophisticated IEEE 1588 switches will actually look for bottlenecks in the network. So, so th in this scenario, it assumes that the outbound delay is symmetrical with the return delay. And in a lot of networks, that's not true. So if there's load balancing, you know, packets are taking different paths through the network to balance loads, or if uh, there's some buffering going on because of a bottleneck, sudden spike in bandwidth, there's buffering going on in the switch. Uh, 1588 will send correction signals or correction information in some of these delay requests and delay response signals. So the, the, the delay request and the initial sync are used to calculate the outbound and the return are actually used to, to calculate the round trip delay. And then that some, some error correction is done along the way for unexpected buffering and uh, packet load, uh, packet rerouting and such. So with all that said, a, a calculation can be made to lock the clock to the master and get it in phase with the master. And then uh, uh, Part of the 1588 protocol is to periodically check this. So every couple hundred milliseconds, or, or, or I'm, not, I'm not sure of the, the timing interval, but uh, it just doesn't set the time and then forget. You know, a switch could be reset. Something could, the uh, clock could get interrupted. So the master is always checking the network. It'll send out its sync packets periodically to make sure all the slave devices are, are uh, uh, in sync and, and playing nicely. So here's a, here's a little block diagram. You know, we show the Typhoon card plugged into a PC. So this, you got multiple cameras. They could be uh, at the same news event. So, so uh, some of the guys at uh, some of the networks are like, well, I don't know if I would take eight cameras at 100 megs of each and pipe them all back to master control, but I might want to eliminate costly SMPTE fiber optic cable or uh, Neutrix optical con cable and network synchronously on my own little uh, intranet at a, at a live event or uh, like, let's take like a, a, an election conference or something like that. Uh, one of the uh, 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 Republican or Democratic conventions or a big sporting event. Then produce the show in a, maybe a smaller vehicle and then send the package show out. So, so it, 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 it may not fit your workflow to do the centralized production, piping all the video back to master control, because you're going to need some pretty fat pipes to do that. And the, you know, the argument is made, you know, well, if I need such a fat pipe, I probably can afford a truck. Or if I can't afford a truck, getting some more bandwidth, getting fatter pipes is, is a less expensive uh, route. So it gives you that flexibility as we move forward and have lower bit rates. I think we'll, we'll open up more doors to folks that don't have a fat pipe and don't have access to a production truck. So it gives you that flexibility or just another way of doing, thinking of it is just another way to, to network your cameras together using an IP workflow instead of using uh, expensive fiber optic cabling, fiber optic infrastructure. HD SDI routing switchers, optical routing switchers. You're just going to use off-the-shelf Ethernet switches that cost a couple of thousand dollars instead of a, a, a 500 by 500 port uh, electro-optical routing switcher that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's just an alternate way of looking at our workflow uh, in, in, in the field or in, in the broadcast space. Again, here I, I show you how uh, as long as you have network connectivity, whether it's through uh, a LAN connection, a fiber optic connection, or even satellite, could be thousands of miles away between the stage box and the control room or the ingest device. Uh, let me see. Oop. I'm 
mouse got stuck for a second. Uh, here's another, uh, this is kind of a future looking statement where we, uh, uh, will, we are planning on releasing a rack mounted version where we take several of the stage boxes, probably four of them, put them in a rack mount, you know, one or two RU box, and then that sits in the rack either in the control room or it could be a telco play. This could sit in the uh, uh, the level three telco closet. Uh, we're talking to guys at level three or people at the switch, where this would be part of their services. Uh, uh, we or the the telco provider could provide this box to sit at the venue, and the broadcaster just plugs their video into it, and the video goes out on the network. Uh, so the sky is really the limit. And then here's the controller units. Uh, video engineer doesn't have to be on site. He can be, you know, back in master control. He could be in a smaller truck. Uh, uh, you know, again, we're not looking to put NEP out of business. I don't think, you know, the the uh, Monday night football with uh, instant replay and fancy graphics, that's not going away. Uh, maybe there's some synergies where this technology could could help those types of productions, networking the video. Uh, for the workflow uh, uh, of an NEP or a Game Creek or, or some of the other uh, mobile production guys that are out there. Uh, maybe NEP can build a fleet of smaller trucks to address uh, uh, a broader uh, swath of the market that can't afford their bigger trucks. Uh, so, so we're really uh, in the uh, 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 figuring out the different applications. Uh, uh, we get the most phone calls per day about Stagebox. So here's just another look at it. You know, here's all the signals, video, time code, sync, genlock, camera, tally, intercom, stage box, Ethernet switch, integrated all into one rack mount box with one network port coming out of it. Uh, I have a video here. Um, let me give you guys a link. I'm not going to play it over the um, um, over the. Uh, uh, let me see if I can put this into the oop, into the show notes. I'll do it when I stop. Um, I, I actually, I don't want you guys playing the video yet. I'm almost done. I've got like two more slides left. But this is a great slide. Um, it's very entertaining. Um, you can see the enthusiasm of the British engineer from the BBC. Um, um, he is speaking English, but not American. So I'm just make that caveat. So uh, you have to listen closely, but I encourage you to, I'll send you a link when I'm done. I can't cut and paste while I'm in the middle of a set. The session, so I'll put that link in in the in the notes. But it's it's very entertaining and gives you kind of the uh, talks about the whole workflow, how they streamed uh, second screen into the web near live for these live uh, uh, concert productions that the BBC did. So you know, again, in conclusion, you know, so why 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 are we offering this to the U.S. market? What what is the purpose of the of the stage box IP camera back? Well, we're extending the master control or the control room or even the truck closer to the camera or to the camera. Uh, we're simplifying your infrastructure. We're getting rid of expensive and proprietary optical 3G HDSDI electrical optical routing switchers, uh, uh, bulky coaxial cabling, bulky fiber optic cabling. And don't get me wrong, um, this is a compressed signal. Uh, we do have a fiber optic camera back system. We are fans of Simpy cabling and, and, and uh, Limo cabling and the Neutrix optical con cabling. If you want your signal completely uncompressed and you don't want any compression uh, during content capture, uh, fiber optic is still the way to go. Uh, but this is just an alternate approach. If uh, there is a trend where people are moving towards an IP workflow, uh, uh, this is something that you might want to consider. Uh, we can set up demos for you. We have a, a demo kit that we've uh, uh, shown in New York and to some of the folks out here in LA. Uh, we don't think production trucks are going to completely go away, but maybe we reduce the size, uh, certainly reduce personnel on site, um, and then it directly integrates into your IP workflow. That's what you're looking for. Uh, when we presented this paper at SIMTI a few weeks ago, we were part of the IP workflow uh, track, uh, you know, IP production. So, so there, there, there is demand for this. Uh, many broadcasters are working this into their workflow. 
So uh, th that kind of sums it up. Um, here's my uh, uh, inf contact information. Those of you that uh, uh, don't have access, uh, you certainly can email me or call me anytime. This is my direct extension. I'm extension 1001. You can email, email me at jimj at vidovation.com. Uh, uh, anyone connected to me on LinkedIn knows I'm, I'm pretty active. Uh, uh, we, we put a lot of content up there. We're active in a lot of the groups. But so, so you just search for Jim Jaquetta on LinkedIn. You'll find me. Uh, we do have a Facebook page and uh, uh, also Twitter. So you can follow us there. 